be so kind as to suggest a prayer? Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Thank you very much, sir. We will be finishing up Lesson 26 today. On Monday, we will use that as a day to watch a video and do a worksheet. I'll be sending you all of the information by email over the weekend. And then next Tuesday, next Tuesday we will have a quiz over Lessons 25 and 26. So just a heads up about that. Today we're going to concentrate on the war here in the United States some of its ramifications. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, there was a concern that the Japanese would then invade the United States. States on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington were quite concerned about this invasion, as was Hawaii. The United States decided that any Japanese American should be arrested and then thrown into an internment camp. Now, Japanese Americans preferred to use the Japanese word, which was Nisei, to explain their plight. The Nisei were arrested under the order of President Roosevelt. The United States Supreme Court agreed with Roosevelt. Congress agreed with Roosevelt. And the Nisei were taken from their homes, mostly on the West Coast or Hawaii, and they were taken to the central part of the United States, the Great Plains. There they were placed in what we called relocation camps. These were nothing more than prisons. Nisei families could not leave. Nisei families' mail was heavily censored. Nisei families uh, information that they received from the outside world was heavily censored. They could have schools, but the schools had to be inside the internment camp. They could have gardens and things like that, but they were essentially prisoners. Well, George Takei, who, was, who is famous for his work in Star Trek, was one of the internees. Let's hear what he has to say. That stereotype of Asian Americans as the enemy was all too real for George Takei. From his very youngest days growing up in Los Angeles. I remember that morning. In fact, I can never forget that morning. It was a terrifying morning. I was in the living room looking out the front window, and I saw two soldiers come marching up our driveway, and I saw at the end of their rifles shiny bayonets. They stomped up to our front door, our two-bedroom home on Garnet Street in Los Angeles, and banged on the front door. It was terrifying. My father answered, and we were ordered out of our home. George Takei's family had committed no crime. Along with thousands of other law-abiding Japanese Americans, they were taken from their home in California in 1942 and forced to relocate to an internment camp. The reason was this. On December 7, 1941, Japan bombed the U.S. Navy base in Pearl Harbor. Overnight, America was at war with Japan and the U.S. government became suspicious of anyone of Japanese heritage. As a group, these U.S. citizens were labeled by their government as enemy non-aliens. What's non-alien? That's a citizen. They couldn't even call us citizens then. 
we were enemy non-aliens. Why? Because of this. We were taken to the horse stables. And thinking back now, I can't imagine how degrading and humiliating it must have been for my parents to take their three children, one a baby, from a two-bedroom home and told to sleep in that narrow, smelly horse stall. I remember the barbed wire fences and the sentry tower, the uh, searchlight that followed me when I made the night runs from our barrack to the uh, latrine. It was a racist act, pure and simple, and it was an unconstitutional act. I mean, you can't imprison people for, for their race, and that's what we were imprisoned for. You know, years later, the Nisei would be given a, a stipend for the money that was supposedly lost, but this stain could never really go away. Uh, Nisei said they were Americans. Nisei said they wanted to fight in the war. And so in 1943, Nisei were allowed to join the United States military with the proviso that they had to fight in Europe. Now, Nisei units are going to serve with distinction. They are going to win many presidential citations, but it is unusual in that the soldiers, when they rode home, their parents, their brothers and sisters, were still in the internment camp. All American men between 18 and 30 could be drafted. Now, I will tell you that World War II was a very popular war, and the draft was not needed for most parts. You could, you could enlist as early as 16. Now, my mother said that many of the young men in her graduating class, St. Peter's 43, they enlisted when they were in their junior year in 42 and they were taken in fact some of them uh, did not return home because that they were killed but again everybody was eligible to be in the army in those days women women were encouraged to become part of the military as well now, if you were a woman and you wanted to join the Navy, then you were called a wave. And if you were a woman and you wanted to join the Army, you were a whack. Now, waves and whacks were responsible for doing jobs that were of a non-combat nature. So, let's say that you are a soldier and you go to the mess hall to eat. In many cases, the people who cook the food, who serve you, are waves or whacks. Let's say that you have a ship, and you have to get from shore to the ship. Well, normally you're taken by a small boat. And in many cases, the women were in charge of the operation of the boat. But the most interesting group were the wasps, the women who served in the Army Air Corps. Here's a lady who tells you about the Army Air Corps and her service. I am a WASP, Women's Air Force Service Pilot. I was born in Canada of American parents and took all my early training in the province of Manitoba. At that time, I heard about the WASP organization, but I had three problems. I was too young. I was 19 instead of being 21. Um, I was a quarter of an inch short, 
and I had uh, we could not I could not get a license in Canada at that time. Uh, Canada went to war in 1939, and this was the early 1940s. Interesting to note that 25,000 women in 1942 applied to get into the WASP organization. All had to be licensed pilots before they went in. They took the same course as the cadets did that were learning to fly for the war. World War II opened up a lot of opportunities for women, but in this case, 25,000 applied, 1,800 were accepted, and 1,074 actually graduated. That was quite a, a, a secret that was kept because they were afraid that people would not want to think of their mothers or sisters or anyone like that flying military planes in a war that was very serious. Now, what the ladies would do is, after the planes had been made, they would get in the planes and fly them to the nearest depot where they could be put on ship, unless they were bombers. Now, if they were bombers, they would have to fly them from where they were made to where they were needed, so they could fly from, say, Grumman in Long Island to um, Great Britain, or uh, fly them from Everett in Washington to Pearl Harbor. Most women preferred to work in factories. In fact, with so many men being in the Army, Women almost had to work in factories. Now, this is a famous picture of Rosie the Riveter, but most women did jobs in factories that helped out the war effort. Now, my mom and her sister Mag went to work for Brown Shoe Company. They had a factory down, just down the street from uh, the old prison, and they made army boots. And my mother said that they worked uh, 40 hours a week, and normally they worked on the weekend as well, because they saw it as their patriotic duty. Native Americans. You know, every time we have taken notes and we've had a war, we have always said that the Native Americans were the people the Army was opposed to. Well, in World War II, Native Americans were an integral part of both the United States Army and the United States Marine Corps. Now, the enemy, and in particular the Japanese, were very good about breaking codes and listening in on conversations. To confuse the enemy, the Army and the Marine Corps Began to began to have Native Americans be part of the communication network. Now, of course, the Native Americans were asked to speak in their native language, which can only be learned by living with the Native Americans. So, when the Navajo code talkers talked into the radio or the field telephones and gave coordinates of the enemy, the enemy could not understand what they were talking about. Well, let's hear from one of the Navajo code talkers talk about his importance, in this case, in the Marine Corps. <laughs> the 17th of September, 1943. I was so proud because uh, I was able to join a Marine. During the boot camp, went to the rifle range. I shot expert the first day. Then final, the next day, I shot shot shooting. 
after a rifle, and then we are like complete in the boot camp, and I made it private first class, one strike. I was ordered to uh, Camp Pendleton. I went inside, I couldn't believe it. These were all a bunch of nowhos. <laughs> I didn't know none of them. So I asked the sergeant the army. I said, I'm in the wrong place, sir. I said, I asked to be at Eric Cunningham and go to Eric Cunningham School. He says, too bad, <laughs> you're here. This is Code Topper School, and you're Navajo. Therefore, they sent you here. We're going to teach you Navajo code. Japanese, they knew every code, and they broke every code that the United States had. Our code was never broken by anyone, even by Navajos. For example, Alphabet was the first one that they worked on it. A, well, actually, next one was Balasana, which means apple. All the way down the line, the letter J is jackass. <laughs> Tell me, <Chucky. laughs> That was a funny one. At the same time, they come out with the New word, mostly uh, weapons like artillery, call it belt on some sun, lots of gun. Motor, call it belt on some time, sitting gun. My unit, 5th Marine Division, landed on the Iwo Jima, February 19, 1945. We used Navajo Code. 100% of the first four to eight hours, we sent close to 800 messages without a mistake. My unit, took me in division, raised a flight on Mount Sarbachi. February 23rd, 1945 at 12.30. We were so proud that we saw that coming. We did something for our country. I'm proud of it. Veterans Day. It's the most important day for everybody to respect all of them that serve in the military. So I would say to veteran, welcome home. Thank you for your services. All of you, thank you very much for serving your country. The United States Marine. All Americans were expected to ration. Everything was rationed. Meat, sugar, flour, metal, tires, gasoline. My, my mother used to always say that during the war it was almost impossible to get sugar. My father said that in their family business of concrete burial vaults, that in many cases they were paid off more in ration coupons for gasoline and rubber than they were in actual cash. My father said that his parents would accept in lieu of cash gasoline ration cards so that they could get the vaults here and there. Americans were asked to pay taxes now, unlike World War I, it was believed that withholding taxes worked out better. Now, prior to World War II, before World War II, you worked the year, and then at the end of the year, your employer gave you a statement of how much money you made. And then you multiplied that figure by the tax rate, and then you wrote a check to the Internal Revenue Service that they had to receive somewhere between January the 1st and the middle of April. But during World War II, the problem was, as you got closer to the end of the year, the government was out of money. So, the easiest way to do this was to, each month, take out a small portion of your salary. We call that a withholding tax. 
I don't know if any of you all work and get paid by your employer, but if you do, look on your pay stub. Did they withhold any money for federal or state income tax? If they did, and you have made less than $18,000 in 2017, which I'm going to assume you did, then you should get all that money back. But the only way you get it back is if you file with the IRS. So again, in January, look on your W-2. Now they should have given you a W-2 because they had to take out for FICA. Look on that W-2 for federal or state withholding. Does it have any figure greater than zero? If it does, get yourself a 1040 EZ, fill it out, clip it on, send it in, and you get all that money back. Americans. Americans were inventive people. And the Americans are going to invent new weapons of war. We made great inroads in science. Now, the greatest inroad during World War II was the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the development of the atomic bomb. But it was a great secret. Nobody could talk about it. I have an Uncle H.C. who got his master's in mathematics from Mizzou in 1940. And when he joined the Army, he was sent to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And the only thing he was allowed to tell anybody was that he was working for the government. It wasn't until after the war that he could tell people that he was on the Manhattan Project. He was responsible for the building of the bomb, although his work was mostly computation. Blacks. Blacks became part of the United States Army during World War II. They were segregated, just like in the Civil War. They were segregated, just like in the Spanish-American War. They were segregated, just like in World War I. Now, in 41, when the war broke out, most blacks were part of the Quartermaster Corps. They put tents up, they took tents down. They drove trucks, they served food, they buried the dead. But the war effort needed more soldiers. So in 42, they became part of the infantry and armor. And by 43, the question was, could blacks fly planes? And in 1943, the Tuskegee Airmen were born. Now, the Tuskegee Airmen, named after the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, was a place where blacks could be taught to fly. Once they were taught to fly, they were shipped overseas, mostly to Italy. And there, they served with great distinction in the United States Army Air Corps. In fact, the highest kill ratio of our planes to the Germans was held by Tuskegee Airmen during the war. Well, Red Tails, a movie, <coughs> came out, oh, about eight years ago, and it follows the exploits of these Tuskegee Airmen. Here's a promo for it. Bogies inbound, 12 o'clock. They called the man right by. They were young men from across America, fighting a war abroad for a country that did not offer them equality of hope. The Tuskegee Airmen fought the enemy while simultaneously fighting racial segregation. Their story is told in the new motion picture Red Tails, directed by Anthony Hemingway. This story isn't told in curriculums in school. I didn't learn it coming and growing up. And uh, to be able to get their stories from them, you know, and to be able to talk to the living history, it's amazing. Beverly Dunjo, who celebrated the opening of Red Tails with fellow Tuskegee Airmen at a screening in Chicago, is part of that living history. He entered the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama in what was then the segregated South during the final year of the war. The time that we endured 
rampant segregation, rampant discrimination, hate, and uh, the names that they call us and the treatment that they uh, gave us that we had to endure, uh, you, can't, you can't describe that. What we do, how well we do it, does it matter? The movie shows how Tuskegee Airmen like Virgil Poole Sr. set out to change widely held stereotypes about African Americans. So there were no skeptics who didn't believe we were going to make it. But I've been told that our pilots became as good as and better than many pilots who had other training that weren't black. In fact, the Tuskegee Airmen were among one of the most decorated air units of the war, getting hundreds of bombers to their targets and back. And not only did we love to fly and we loved the combat activity, but we knew that if we were good, the society would change. But Dr. Roscoe Brown's hope of changing society did not materialize right away. The reporters didn't care about the, uh, the black pilots at all. And uh, as a result, they wrote nothing about it. This is slight order than verified. Actor Cuba Gooding Jr. plays an officer in Red Tails. He says the film gives the Tuskegee Airmen the credit they deserve. And they were officers and they were denied access into the officers club. And uh, they finally stood together as brothers in arms and said, you know, we're, we're actually fighting a double war. We're fighting the Germans over the skies of Berlin. We're also fighting the military and the fact that we, you know, we die for our country. And we need the respects afforded to our, you know, our counterparts, our Caucasian counterparts. So I think, uh, you know, I think there's, there's something to, for everybody to learn. Dr. Roscoe Brown says the film contains an important lesson. The segregation is a blot on American history, and we help to remove that blot by our excellence. That excellence paved the way for the desegregation of the U.S. military in 1948. On behalf of the office I hold, and a country that honors you, I salute you for the service to the United States of America. And the Congressional Gold Medal for the Tuskegee Airmen in 2007. King Fairball, VOA News, Chicago, Illinois. During the war, not only did blacks serve in the military, but blacks also served in industry and became integral parts of industry. And many black leaders demanded by the end of the war that President Roosevelt do something about segregation. Roosevelt promised that he would integrate. Now, of course, Roosevelt did not live to see the end of the war. Truman, however, would integrate the Army. Truman would come up with federal plans to integrate the federal government. But integration truly did not occur until the 60s, under Eisen, under Kennedy and Johnson. In 1944, it is a presidential election year. Franklin Roosevelt is nominated by, for a fourth term by Democrats. Roosevelt selects Harry Truman, U.S. Senator from Missouri, to be his running mate. Truman had made a name for himself during the war as a senator who looked into cost overruns. The Republicans, the Republicans chose Thomas Dewey, governor of New York. Now Dewey had made a name for himself by going after organized crime during the late 1930s. So it is Roosevelt, the Democrat, versus Dewey, the Republican. The picture isn't very good. The red states are Mr. Roosevelt. The blue states are Mr. Dewey. It is an easy victory for President Roosevelt in both popular and electoral college votes. Roosevelt would be inaugurated in January he would go to Yalta for the conference in 45. Upon his return, he went to Warm Springs, Georgia to rest. And while in Warm Springs, Georgia, he will have a brain hemorrhage, a stroke, where he will die. 
Now, the body would be taken by train from Georgia to Washington, D.C. Here, the body is being moved from Union Station to the Capitol. And then after that, it would go from the Capitol up to Hyde Park, New York, which is where he's buried today. This is one of the few pictures ever taken of Harry Truman as he is sworn into office. Now, he's sworn into office by the Speaker of the House, which is kind of unusual. And here is Bess Truman. Bess Truman was not a big fan of Harry being president. In fact, Bess Truman spent as much time in Independence, Missouri, when Truman was in Washington, D.C., as she could. She she did not like D.C. at all. By the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union are the only two superpowers left around, and they will remain the world's only two superpowers until the 1970s. And in the 70s, we'll go to three, and today, I think legitimately the United States can be the only country considered a superpower. The rest of Europe and Asia is in ruins. All total, close to a quarter of a million American servicemen lost their lives. Now, the men are normally buried close to the battlefield. This is a bad, this cemetery is in the country of Belgium. But there's also huge cemeteries in Great Britain. There's a couple in France. There's a couple in Germany. There's a huge one in the Philippines. There's another one in New Guinea. Several of the islands uh, that the Americans invaded, like Wake and Guam, have cemeteries. Now, the only one that's really causing any concern right now is the one in Okinawa. Okinawa is part of Japan, and Japan is not too happy to see that cemetery. Never has been, but the United States refuses to, to remove it. Now, the 2,250,000 American soldiers killed would be from five different groups. There would be U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, U.S. Army Air Corps, U.S. Marines, and U.S. Coast Guard. Would anybody like to take a guess at which group contributed to the most dead? Was it Army, Navy, Marines, Army Air Force, or Coast Guard? Sir? No, Marines actually came in third. Marines came in third. Please? Navy. Navy came in fourth. We're going in the wrong direction. Please? The Army. The Army. The Army had the most dead. Remember the Army fought in both Europe and in the Pacific. Remember Douglas MacArthur had command of the Army. So they had the most dead. Then would come the Army Air Corps. The Army Air Corps had the highest mortality rate. Now, mortality rate means that of all the people involved, the greatest number were killed. Now, if you were in a bomber, all you had to do was fly 25 <coughs> missions. And if you could fly 25 missions, you were sent home. Only about 40% of the bomber crews made it to 25 missions. If you were a fighter pilot, you only had to serve 50 missions. If you serve 50 missions, then you could be sent home. And only about half of all fighter pilots made it to 50 missions. So if you were in the Army Air Corps, although you were smaller in number, you stood a better chance of being killed than quite honestly all others combined, which a lot of times people don't realize. Well. This last video deals with the war and kind of sums it up.
years to the day after it began, the bloodiest war in history drew to a close. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're looking at the final days of World War II and how it finally came to an end. World War II officially ended on September 2, 1945, but the events that led to the Allied victory were put into motion earlier in the war. A number of important events took place in April and May of 1945 that helped lead to the war's end. In the early years of the war, the Axis successfully advanced throughout Europe, with invasions of countries like France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. However, 1940's Battle of Britain turned the tide and halted German advances through Western Europe. More failed Axis invasions followed, but 1941's attack on Pearl Harbor finally brought the United States into the fight. By 1942, fighting two fronts proved too challenging for the Nazis, and the Axis lost momentum. The Battle of Stalingrad, in particular, proved to be a turning point, where the Allies took full advantage. 1944 saw more Allied victories, such as the June 6 attack of German forces at Normandy, France, that is now called D-Day. By the end of that year, the Axis downfall was imminent. Amid more Allied pushes through Europe, on April 27, 1945, Benito Mussolini was captured while he tried to escape Italy for Switzerland. He was killed the next day, and this directly led to the surrender of the Italian fascist forces. Just a few days later, on April 30th, Adolf Hitler committed suicide while hiding from the bloody Battle of Berlin in a bunker. He did so to avoid being caught and killed like Mussolini. May 1st saw Nazi forces in Italy surrender to the Allies. German forces throughout Europe continued to surrender in the days that followed. And finally, unconditional German surrender was announced on May 8th and 9th, and this was followed by a German ceasefire shortly thereafter. The last holdout of the Axis powers was Japan. Though that country had started out winning most battles, the Allies and the Americans began to triumph more and more. The culmination of the nuclear arms race came in early August 1945, when the Allies, led by the United States, dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in an effort to quickly end the war. The day the second bomb was dropped, the Soviets joined the Pacific fight by invading part of Northeast Asia. These shocking events helped finally put an end to the battle. On August 15, 1945, Japan surrendered after experiencing tremendous casualties. Finally, the surrender documents were signed September 2, 1945. The war was over, and the Allies had claimed victory. Officially, it took until December 13, 1946, for the hostilities to end between the United States and Germany. And with that, we are done with 26. A reminder that we will be heading down to Stations of the Cross in just a few moments. We will leave everything here and we will go down the staircase that is to our left. We'll come back and then enjoy the music.